Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this very special edition of Traders Workshop for Thursday, April 6th. I'll be your host, Tom Schneider, CMT with Ninja Trader. And before we get into our very special guest, I do want to remind everybody that futures and options trading contain substantial risk is not for every trader. You could potentially lose all or even more than all of your initial investment. That's why we recommend you use risk capital. What is risk capital? It's money you can afford to lose. It doesn't keep you up at night. It doesn't extend your retirement horizon. I also want to remind everybody that past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. And what we talk about here on this show contains neither trade recommendations nor financial advice and should be taken for educational purposes only. And again, as it is every time we have this guest on the show, it is my pleasure to welcome trader and author extraordinaire Larry Williams. How you doing, Larry? Great, Tom. Thanks very much for having me. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to doing this a lot. Oh, oh yeah. We're, we're happy to have you and, and always excited to have you on and hear what you have to say. But I have to ask, where in the world are you today? <laughs> Almost didn't make the show today. We live, of course, in the U.S. Virgin Islands in St. Croix. And we had a power failure start about three hours ago. We had no power. So we're scrambling around. We called our friends. Their generator wasn't working. Ours wasn't working. We finally had a backup. But then about half an hour ago, boom, the power came back. So here we are, live and direct from the beautiful U.S. Virgin Islands. That's great. Well, we're, we're you know, happier uh, then you could tell about having you back on here. And, you know, we haven't seen you this year yet. This is, we're already into the second quarter. I can't believe how much this year has gone by so fast. But, you know, just kind of interested to hear what you have, wh what your thoughts are for 2023. And I think that'll be the focus of today's show. Absolutely. I've done my PowerPoint to focus on this and really show some specific markets and things that I think are happening. But um, bottom line, in terms of the stock market, we are in a bull market we have been we're going to continue being in a bull market all the cassandras the purveyors of pessimism will again be proven wrong we're going to see prices move higher this year i love it i love it so maybe uh mission control if we could sw uh, switch over to uh, this really nice uh, visual i'm looking at that larry put together i love it well, I hope I'm your favorite ninja warrior, but you know, at my age, I'm not much of a warrior anymore. <laughs> I used to be when I was a little younger, but but uh, I still like to battle and using, trading the markets is always a battle. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I think we can just get right into it. Okay, let's do it. Here we go. Um, I trade futures and um, there's a real reason why, uh, you know, you can trade futures, options, stocks, options on stuff. I think Tom Cruise really said it best. Remember that show, Show Me the Money? Well, if you look at reality where people really make money, especially on a shorter term basis, it's always in the futures markets. If you look at these trading contests that they have for stocks, futures, options, Forex, the largest gains historically have always come from future traders, not from option traders or Forex who should have the largest gains. But consistently, it's been future traders. So that intrigues me because if I'm looking around as a speculator, where, what market do I want to be in? Uh, I, I see that the lower hanging fruit in this business is futures. Those people have consistently done the best in real-time trading championships with real money. And that obviously means a great deal to me. So based on that, my emphasis really since the, somewhere in the 1971 Except maybe 1970. I've really been a commodity futures trader. Oh, I do stocks. I know a little bit about that. You'll see me on Kramer's Mad Money and all that with stocks. But I'm going to be talking about gold, uh, today crude oil, the stock market. And there's a really good short-term trading coming up. There's really two of them. Uh, but one I'm going to give you that's a, a little bit more in advance. Um, so when I look at the markets, I, I talked to Tom earlier about this. I first started trading in 1962, started following the markets. And back then, this is an interesting historical perspective. The only place you could really trade commodities at was Merrill Lynch, Mother Merrill. And then that started to change over the years. And then it was Dean Witter, Kidder Peabody, Walston. They offered commodity trading. So there was a shift and a, an individual really couldn't trade with Merrill anymore. Uh, their commissions went real high for a public trader. And we had real brokers, of course. We called up the brokers. We went to the broker firm office. We, we, were, we knew our brokers. My brokers were my godparents and my children. Um, we were really close. Well, that relationship has started to change 
And then commodity trading really switched from brokerage firms to Clayton Commodities, uh, Cargill, some firms that were just commodity only firms. But again, with real brokers, not, not like how we trade now. Uh, then we had the shift to electronic trading. Uh, it really, you know, I'm a futures trader. Larry, well, real quick, I, can I just interject? Uh, when I was young, out of school, before I broke into this business, golfing with an older family member who brought along a friend who was a broker, stockbroker, and his comment resonated with me. He said, the market goes up, I make money. If the market goes down, I make money, right? He didn't care about market direction. And this was right before brokerage for the stock market went electronic. So here he was on this really nice golf course saying, ah, you know, I'm a stockbroker and, you know, you remember commissions back. This was early, early 90s. Even. You know, commissions were, you know, tens of dollars, not nothing that, that people can trade now. So a lot has changed, right, in, in 30 plus years. Huge change. Brokerage commission used to be $75. And we're talking about $75, not today's money, but in 1960, 1970 money. Then lo and behold, we got a discount commissions we could trade for $25. Wow, that was phenomenal. And right. now it's like, you know, it's not even a consideration. Uh, so, yeah, it's changed. And what's really changed, a, a societal part of that, it used to be the wealthiest guys in town were doctors, lawyers, and stockbrokers. Because remember, when I started trading stocks in the 1960s, you didn't pay a commission as you do now. You paid a percentage of the dollar transaction. So if you bought, say, $60,000 of stocks, you paid, I think, one or one and a half percent of $60,000. So, it, it, you know, the commission was totally different structure then. So uh, they were very, very expensive back then. It was hard to get filled then. You couldn't always get filled at a price. So now I think this is much, much easier. I just a click of a button. Oh my gosh, what you can do with a click of a button is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, be really right. careful how you click those buttons uh, and you're filled. Like, you know, it used to be hard to get a thousand bonds filled. I have to have guys in the pit, two different people working my orders for me. Now, click, it's done, boom. Uh, so yeah, there's been a, a huge change in this business. Well, let's look at gold. Uh, people typically think that the drivers of gold is inflation. Um, I don't think so. And I'm going to show you some data on that today. I think that gold really essentially is a supply demand market, just like the other future markets. That's my view. I know it's going to differ with a lot of the gold bug views, but let me let me show you why I feel that way. First of all, here's a chart. Uh, black is gold and red is inflation. And the idea in 1977 was a big bull market in gold. And everybody said, oh, look at that. Inflation was up. Gold was up. Therefore, Everybody got the idea that gold is driven by inflation. Hmm. Until we came along in 1983, 1984, look how inflation, we're looking here at the annualized rate of change of inflation, huge change of inflation, and gold went down. Like, wow, that's not supposed to happen. Hmm. And then when inflation was declining here, gold actually started to rally. Now, if we go forward into the 1987 time period, at times we see inflation picks up and gold picks up. But we see inflation can pick up and they don't always dance together. Here we had a big increase in inflation and that led to a decline in the gold market. So I don't think that it's driven totally by, and here's the best example, in 2000, gold went down. And look at the huge increase we had in inflation. So this flies in the face of what people have said, inflation drives gold. No, it didn't drive gold. And when we have huge declines in gold and in inflation, gold may or may not do anything. It should start to rally substantially here and went around for quite a few years. But sometimes it does move with inflation. But it's really not as simplistic as I think people have made it. Well, I know you're thinking, where are we right here right now? A again, this is interesting. We started to pick up inflation, but the big bull market in gold was 2018 to 2020 when inflation was going down. It clearly, inflation influenced the gold market rally we saw last year. But now look where the rate of inflation is. Now it's coming to the downside and gold's rallying. So uh, I think that it's not the big driving force that people have made it out to be in the gold market. It's just a lesson and observation. You can't bet the farm in gold based on inflation. It's not the big driving force. 
And by the way, these numbers were just released just a few hours ago from the uh, New York Federal Reserve, and they have uh, some great uh, inflation data there. You can see what inflation has happened. It started to peak about 2022, and it's continued coming down. So my view is we're going to be seeing less inflation, which means maybe Mr. Powell at the Federal Reserve is going to stop increasing interest rates or hold them flat for a while. So clearly we see, and this is the Federal Reserve in New York, that inflation started to come down. And I think that's a really good thing to see in the marketplace. It started to finally roll over here. Okay. The other thing people say, well, when the markets crash, gold will go down. Well, here's the crash of 2020 in the stock market. And uh, gold, uh, gold should go up in a crash, right? Gold went down. Uh, if you go back and look at all the major crashes in history, gold doesn't go up when stocks crash. It usually moves directly in line with the future markets. So it's another kind of wives' tale about how to trade gold. Uh, here's 2022. We had a big de decline in the market. There's stocks and there's gold. You can look at it yourself in your ninja charts. You can, it's really nice thing in ninja. You can put one chart on top of another and watch the comparison between the two of them. Stocks went down, gold went down. So don't think that if we have a depression, recession, the end of the world, the base bear market ever, that gold will bail you out. I don't think it's going to. It hasn't in the past. Why would it in the future? Okay, time for a commercial break. This is what I think drives the gold market, the commercials. The people that produce gold, the people that use gold are called the commercials. We get this uh, we get their actual position at the market every week from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. If you're not aware of it, it's called the Commitment to Traders Report. I'm the first guy to ever write about this way back in 1973. And it has been a delightful thing to write about and to trade with. Now, broken down, the Commitment to Trade Report shows us three particular players. The blue line are the large traders or funds. The green line is the public, and the red line are the commercials, the users and producers. These are the smart guys. Notice when the smart guys start buying, as this line comes up, they're increasing their position, gold rallies. They increase their position, gold rallies. They increase their position, gold rallies. They increase their position, gold rallies. These guys are so good in a gold market. Uh, the opposite side of that coin, if you look at the blue line guys, the large fund traders, Notice they're at the highest they've been for a long time, major sell markets in the gold market. They get real high, the market declines. So, boy, if there's a fundamental driving force of this market, I think it's the commercials. They're the ones that I really want to pay attention to. We can actually put that into an indicator, uh, which we have in Ninja, of course. And we can see when the commercials are doing a lot of selling right here. And when they're doing a lot of buying, you get a pretty good idea. When there are heavy buyers in here, we rally. When there are heavy sellers, prices come down. So the commercials, and this is real money we're talking about, actual positions in the marketplace, they're the, per, the people that really drive this market. They're the influencer. We talked about the public. We call those small speculators. And we have an index for the small speculators. When they're really bearish in the market, the index is down here. Well, when they're really bearish, look what happens. They're really bearish, the market rallies. They're really bearish, the markets rally. They got really bearish, the market rallied. Right now, they've got to get to a little too bullish in here. So it's a nice, I won't take a signal just because of these indicators, the commercials or the small speculators. This is what I call a setup. I'm a setup conditional trader. I look for conditions that get set up for a buy or a sell. Then I confirm that with other tools. And then I look for the timing of the entry. But I love to see when the small speculators have been selling and the commercials have been buying because the small speculators can't be right very long. So I know that a trend change is coming in the market. So I also have a really unique indicator, which is really my pride and joy of all the indicators I've created, my valuation index. We can value stocks based on PE ratios, um, price to sales ratios. How do you value a commodity? Well, I think we can value the underscoring idea of what this is worth. And we've done that with our valuation index for gold. And notice when we're in the low area, we're undervalued. We're here and here and over here. It's an indicator I developed years and years ago. And when we're in the high area, we're overvalued, we typically see declines. The thing with about fundamentals, though, is they're not timing, they're setup tools. They say, 
were in the area to expect a reversal, but they have nothing to do with timing the market. They're the setup tool. And you can see right here, right now, we've been overvalued and now we're kind of a no man's land, so it's not giving a strong signal. But in terms of seasonality of the gold, this is when gold usually starts to decline. Just about this time period. You see last February and March, the decline started. So we see, oh, we see the commercials have been buying this market or the commercials and the public. And then we can look at the seasonality of what's going on in the marketplace. So that starts to tell us about what to expect and how to face this market. Another thing I really like, because there's a great influence I've talked about before here on crude versus uh, gold. They really move hand in hand. The red price that you see, the red line is crude oil prices, but moved 18 weeks forward. Look how they top and bottom. Just in other words, a great forecast for gold. The forecast from crude oil is really interesting here. It suggests a down move in here and sideways and maybe an up move coming in August sometime, but a very choppy market. Whereas in the past, it's predicted pretty much a trending market. And that's what gold did. Again, we're looking 18 weeks into the future of what probably will happen to gold based on the relationship to crude oil. So now we start to get an idea uh, that we probably we saw seasonality start to come down in here. Crude oil says we're close to a peak. We can now start looking for some type of a sell. I really like cycle forecasts. Uh, hopefully one of these days we'll do the cycle forecast reports for Ninja Traders in some way or another. It would be a, a fun thing to do. Um, the cycle forecast suggests this rally we're in now can continue probably until May, and then we're going to see a decline. Notice that usually about this time period, a decline from here to here, a decline, there to there, a decline. So I think we're probably in an up phase until we get into the May, middle of May, and then I'm going to be looking for sell signals in the gold market. So what I'm trying to show you here is that conditions or fundamentals drive the markets, but they don't time the markets. You really need to keep that in mind that just because the fundamentals are there, you don't necessarily want to buy or sell. Um, that's what charts do. Charts are for timing the market, for saying the trend has changed. That's the purpose of charts. Charts are a reflection of what's going on. They're, they're not a condition of what will happen in the future. They're saying, this is what price has been doing. The things I found that worked in futures trading are fundamental. We've talked about that. Cycles, seasonals, these intermarket relationships. I just showed that to you in crude, right? So maybe get an idea that, well, here's a, here's a great example. Stocks in China are greatly influenced by the price of crude oil because they're a heavy consumption of crude oil country and they don't produce much themselves. So their stock exchange is heavily influenced by crude oil prices. And of course, there are some technical things we can use as well. So that's what I think, if you could capitalize my 60 some years of doing this, what moves markets, there it is for you. So Larry, before so, we go on, I, I just wanna please. Um, you know, question, or I have a question. You That chart with crude and gold, you, you came up with 18 weeks, Right. Uh, push ahead. First of all, to be able to see that is is to me remarkable because it's it's not arbitrary, right? You discovered that 18 weeks in advance is what in your uh, research has kind of figured out. But just figuring that out, even with today's tools, being able to take one data set and push it forward or push it backwards is easy now. But if you figured this out before, you know you had the 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 technology. That to me is something that not only is is very insightful, but very difficult. I think to line up charts when you're doing it by hand or or you know with the with the technology you had, let's say in the 70s, in the 80s. Well, it's still not easy today, um, and I'll tell you why. And we did do this even in the in the 70s, um, but things would. There's always a shift because right now high interest rates have a big effect on the market. Uh, so crude oil prices may not have the same effect when interest rates are low. And those are the two driving forces of the economy, interest rates and crude oil. Crude oil controls the world right now. So those relationships then spill over into the market. So they adapt and you have to kind of follow them. Uh, we used to think of silver and pork bellies when we could trade pork bellies, move the same. They're called silver bells, right? And it, they, were, they were just moving in unison and then all of a sudden it stopped working. 
So you got to be careful of these things that look like they work, you know, but they really don't or they stop working. But I mean, we know the crude oil prices are just huge in the world. So is it logical to expect that crude oil prices are an influencer? Uh, yeah, I really think so. So sure. um, I, I like to look at these big influencers, crude oil, interest rates, stock prices. Okay, let's go to, um, uh, you know, this is a big thing. I think conditions move the markets and people say waves and all these things. I don't think so. I think that things really move. And this is the way the market, this is my my idealized view of the markets. Prices go from A to B because of conditions, fundamentals. They dance around like this because of news stories, presidents, politics, scams that are announced, banks that go bankrupt. That's why we have the crazy activity just the emotions of the day. The market really knows cyclically it's going to go from here to here. But this is the, the jittery things that everybody sees in their charts. So if you know you're going to go from here to here, you want to be a buyer of breaks and you want to be a seller of, of strong rallies. So there's actually a theory, believe it or not, a really working theory of how this usually is going to pan out. We talked about crude oil a little bit. So let's dive into crude oil and see where it's going to go if this is interesting to me if we look at the consumption of crude oil well you'd expect the united states and china to be number one but look at number three is india and saudi arabia we were just in doha and dubai and they're using massive amounts of it over there and i think this shows us where the real powers of the world are the people that are producing because it takes crude oil to produce there they are there's the five top, and we see Japan, Russia, of course, not nearly as powerful as people think that it is. Um, they're down in the area of South Korea. So this is really, these are the big countries in the world right now in terms of the consumption of energy, which means in terms of production as well. Okay, well, how about right here, right now, right? So let's bring up to where we are. I am long the energy markets. You'll see that in a moment because I still really trade. Even at my age, at almost 81, I'm still trading. I like this stuff, right? I do. Um, this is a seasonal pattern for crude oil. It typically starts to rally from here to here. Hmm. The commercials, we talked about those guys earlier. When they get up in this area, we expect prices to rally. We can see the commercial buying down here. They look, they're heavy buyers during this entire trading range. It broke to the downside. They continue to buy. And they bought the break. And our valuation model right here was undervalued. So we had undervalued, seasonal to rally, commercials buying. And the small speculators, the public, uh, look at that. That was the lowest amount of buying they'd done for years. So it's no surprise that crude oil has rallied right now, as has um, unleaded gasoline and heating oil. Um, we can then go to short-term charts and look at this is accumulation line. And notice as price was going lower, accumulation on each of these declines wouldn't sell off very much so this market's under accumulation and tom dear old percent r you know i did that where in 1960 something it was in the buy zone as well so you know you got a pretty good shot it might not be a winning trade which is why you need to have stops and risk control and all those things top uh, tom talked about earlier but pretty good idea that this market should rally and indeed you know it's had a really nice rally in here uh, of course the question is how much longer will it rally? I mean, I'm long. I want to know, right? Well, this the cycles. Notice pretty systematic. We've had lows in this market on a pretty continual basis. There's one coming up about the end of July. And right now, this rally should continue well into the first part of April, probably around the middle of May before we start to see it come down. So as a trader, that gives me an idea. This is a trade that should have some legs to it that I want to hold on to. So I can then use trailing stops or targets to exit the trade. So they really have it pretty much under control. I've got my protective stops. I have a pretty good idea, not how high it will go necessarily, but certainly how long this rally should last. Going way out on the market, though, I notice that starting in May, um, using the long-term cycles, we've usually gone down from 1984 to 2022. Most of the time we've gone down, you can see the cycle that we're in uh, into 2024. So I'm going to be paying attention to that once we get in that May time period to see if we're still following this time frame. If we are, we could see an expectation for crude oil later this year to move to the downside. 
and this is the pattern right here. I'm going to show you the pattern. You know, you, wow, this looks so easy. All I have to do is sell here. It ain't that easy. Here was the exact same pattern in 1984 where the market peaked a little bit later. It came down like we would anticipate, came down a little bit lower. So you still have to trade. This just gives you an idea of the bias you should have in the market. And here it was again in 2006, uh, the market bottomed a little bit earlier. So all these cycles and waves do can do is give us an idea of how to trade. This was pretty good. The high was a couple of days earlier. The low was right about on the low time period. But you know, still, it's not that easy. You still have to be a trader. Just because you have a projection, the market should move like that. It's it's going to generally follow it. Specifically, I'm not good enough to get up to get to that speed yet. Maybe I don't think I ever will be because there's so much randomness in this business. But though, even with this, as they say in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So if we have these tools that are available in Ninja from me and a lot of other great people out there. If you get tools that work for you, suddenly your eyes are opened up. You have a visibility of these markets and understanding of the market that other people don't have. So it's very frustrating to be a trader. But I found the more knowledge you have, the the better your approach is going to be, the more success you can have in this business. Because we we don't have 99% of the future figured out, but we got a good chunk of it figured out. Okay, let's turn our attention to the stock market. Rubini, big popular guy, says stock should brace for a meltdown right here, right now. Wells Fargo saying stock should tumble. Morgan Stanley, expect a 30% drop. The rich dad, poor dad guy, this is the biggest crash of our lifetime coming up. Lee Cooperman says it's a textbook financial crisis. I'm going to be with Lee in April. Tom DeMarc is being uh, given the annual Lifetime Achievement Award at the Market Technicians Association. And uh, Mr. Cooperman, myself, and Tom, a couple other guys are going to be together for a baseball game. So uh, it'll be interesting to talk to Lee because he's really bearish. He was former head of Goldman Sachs. And this guy is, you know, he's a very connected, very intelligent guy, he's been very successful. But I see all this stuff, especially biggest crash of our lifetime. Oh, come on. Ah, you guys don't remember, Tom. This is not even a name you'll remember. Vern Myers. Vern Myers is maybe the best writer I've ever read, and he was perpetually bearish. He would get his newsletter. We used to get physical newsletters, and you had to read it in the sunlight. This guy was so bearish. And he'd been bearish from 1947 to when he died in 1974. And there's just these Cassandras, this, this industry of bearishness out there. And I think I'd be very careful of that. Um, these guys are all intelligent, but I think we get a better idea. Like, uh, you know, this is what I say. You saw what they said. I say, duh, look at this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the seasonal tendency of the e-mini Dow is to go up. The commercials, the red line we've been talking about, where are they? They're in the buy area. And look how they've been buying the decline. And the public, the green line, they were, they were the most bearish they've been since back over here, and we're undervalued. So I say, duh, maybe we're going to have a crash in two years, or I don't know when, but if ever. But right here, right now, which is the world that I live in, where we are as traders, I say, come on, what are you guys looking at? The commercials of buyers, we have a, usually rally this time of the year, and the public isn't buying. They're negative on the market, and we're undervalued. Hello? So... That's my approach to the market. And I don't mean to belittle these other guys, but they're maybe longer term view or they're not a specific trading. But in my life, my trade is going to be, you know, three weeks, two weeks, five or six weeks, maybe. Um, so maybe I just have a shorter time frame. But I think this is more immediate because comments like this don't help me as a short to intermediate term trader. And they're all meaningless, really. Uh, the feeling has scare me to death. So I'm not going to do anything. And one thing I've learned is you can't be scared out of this. Vic Niederhofer, God bless his soul, was so in, helpful in my life of getting me to understand that we all have a bearish bias, but the long-term trend of the market is up. And if you're going to be bearish, you're going to be wrong more than you're going to be right. Um, just a brief pitch for what I do. I do have a futures and commodity trading course. You can learn this stuff from me. You can go to our website, everytrade.com, and find out more about it. I'll have a couple more comments in a moment. But here's the big question traders always ask. How long is this going to rally? Seasonal patterns and cycles will help, right? 
So in a seasonal pattern, oh, this rally in the S&P can rally into May time frame. We get that just from the seasonality of the market. So we can answer these questions. Cycles can do that. And judgment call. I'll look at the advanced decline line, really important indicator. And then these trailing stops. And are there places, places this market should run to? Yeah, these old closes up here, we're probably going to run into some resistance. I'd like to take some profits in there. So you think this through, kind of logically organize the structure of this, you'd be a lot better trader because you're not acting off of your emotions. Um, okay, I love this chart. There's been a lot of talk recently in the economic circles that tax receipts drive the stock market. I'm going way back to 1963 now. The red line is tax receipts. So when tax receipts are going up, the economy is good and stocks rally, right? Pretty simple. When tax receipts are declining, stocks uh, decline. As tax receipts start to increase, people are paying more taxes. It means that they're making money. The economy is good again. Really close relationship there. Now look at that. Look how closely tax receipts follow the market. But here is the kicker to this. Stocks lead. Notice that this is the tax receipts and this is the stock market. The stock market leads. In other words, all these tops and turns were really forecast by the stock market, which I think is telling us, telling me at least, that we're going to see tax receipts start to increase now because stocks have rallied. And that's bullish. That would mean that business is getting better. So I think the one of the very best indicators of the market is of the economy is the stock market. And there's a great example of how the stock market is a really good leading indicator. If we look at GDP, gross domestic product, here again, we see the same relationship of stocks leading GDP. And GDP came down, if stocks started to come up, I would expect also to see GDP start to increase now. And that's been a strong relationship. When stocks get strong, then later on GDP increases. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this rally we've been in since last October will continue and it looks like it is now, which would really put the nail in the coffin of the bears, I think, and say GDP business is getting better. There are still problems. Larry, yes. Larry, uh, you know, to that point, when the stock market is leading the GDP curve, uh, this indicates, you know, based on history, that GDP should turn up, which in turn will is, you know, proxy for the economy. It is the economy, essentially. You know, economy is getting better, which should result in a, in a better situation for the stock market to go even further. Is that what I'm kind of hearing? Yes, that, and I think the maybe that point that things are good, we should see higher price, but also it, it tells me no recession. There's all these recession freaks out there. But if you look at the Federal Reserve recession indicators, and they have two or three really good ones, there is no recession coming, or at least these indicators, which have been highly accurate for the last 40, 50 years, uh, are going to blow this one. So when I look at the recession indicators from the Fed and I see, oh, we should see GDP start to pick up, uh, I don't see how there's going to be a recession, which is what the bears camp, oh, the world's falling apart, the bankruptcies, the banks, the recession. I think there will be a recession. There's a time to be bearish. I, I love being bearish. I made my first million dollars on the bear side of the markets. But I don't think it's now based on what we've seen if we look at cycles of this you know what they're looking for us now uh, i think we continue moving up into the may time frame as well so that's positive for us now this is really interesting and tom sent me this and we talked about this you can do cycles on an interday basis this little line it forecasts in advance what's going to happen so this sell-off was in the market was known of 66 bars in advance. This is a 15 minute bar chart, right? And look how closely price follows this little cyclical indicator. This is a formula I developed many, many years ago, actually based on the price of Apple stock. But a pretty good idea. Oh, we're going to start to rally in here. Come on up uh, about 1030 uh, tomorrow. We start to pull down and then we have a pickup rally again. So if you really do like interday stuff, uh, you really want to get our cycle forecast tool. And it's been and, great in a 15 minute bar chart. And, and Larry, to, you know, full disclosure, you can see at the bottom of the chart what time this this chart picture was taken, right? That was around 930 this morning, maybe 915, 930. 
And what's what's yeah. happened? <laughs> I, what's happened power, since I then? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what's happened. You tell me. I'll tell you that it's uh, we've rallied up to forty one twenty six. Oh, so um, we follow you know, the I, forecast. Yeah. We're following the forecast. So uh, again, past performance not indicative, but this is something that if we had an updated picture, you'd see the you'd see it follow that orange line. Yeah, it's it. I mean, it's not going to call every top and bottom in the marketplace, but to me intellectually it's interesting that we can get a handle on the future is it perfect absolutely not but we had a pretty good idea of where price is going so the older i get the the more i think that it's all about cycles and i may be way off base on that i originally thought that when i started trading in the 1960s and i've come back to that kind of full circle of after going through all this other stuff that the market really knows where it's going it's on this path the path is going to be erratic but the market has a path. I don't know if it's predestined, but it has a path that is working out. Again, you can learn this stuff from me if you want to learn how I trade futures and commodities. Uh, we're going to in a class now. Registration closes April 7th. You can go to iReadyTrade.com. And if you want to learn how to trade futures, not day trading. We don't. If you want to learn day trade, don't go to me. I'm not a day trading guy. I'm not interested in that. Um, but if you want to learn, you know, trades for, you know, 10, 12 days, longer than that, uh, and you want to learn how to do what I do, go to iReadyTrade.com. But remember, we're close on April 7th. And we will have a special users group for people that sign up with Ninja. So they're going to walk you through how to use the indicators, get them set up and all that, which will be really helpful to you. And we thank uh, Tom for setting that up. Well, that's it. I want to thank Tom and everybody at Ninja Trader. I hope I'm still your favorite Ninja Trader after all that we've been through. I don't know if I am or not, but I, I hope you've, you've learned some things today. Uh, Tom's had some great comments. Uh, there are other comments coming in. I'll be here, of course, but uh, it's it, it's just so exciting to me to talk about the markets and share the little bit of knowledge I have and the research I do. And hopefully it's meant a lot to you today. And I, I appreciate being here. Well, Larry, I, you know, I've, I've been kind of quiet because I just like uh, hearing what you have to say. It's just so, you know, I take it all in. There's so much there to take in. So I appreciate it. And I'm sure I, I'm speaking for all of our viewers and certainly from us at, at Ninja Trader. Jim and I are looking forward to next Friday uh, for the, you know, we're putting together this uh, special class for your students. So uh, if you want to join, just go to iReallyTrade.com. And, and learn more about that. And I'm looking forward to the CMTA symposium where Tom will be honored, but I, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of stuff going to happen there. But uh, uh, see, uh, if you're a member of the, uh, the Chartered Market Technicians, whatever we call ourselves now, we're having our <laughs> annual meeting in New York City at the end of April, and that's going to be a great event. I'm, Tom DeMarc's been one of my two dearest friends my entire life, and I have a few words to say about Tom, some funny and some kind. It'd be a nice time. Yeah, and and you're gonna, I'm sure you're gonna have a good time at the ballpark uh, with Tom and and you know your your friends there. That'll be fun. It hopefully it's warm. You know, right now I love opening day, but I don't want to go. You know. Well, and hopefully the Mets win. But uh, Tom's uh, advisor, Steve Cohen, who owns the Mets, and I've uh, Steve has been, gosh, we've known each other for thirty years now. I guess he's a remarkable trader. I mean, the uh, best I have ever seen. I've seen some things that he's done, and it's, wow, this guy is out of the world. Uh, so I look forward to just sitting around with these great people and listening. It'll kind of make me learn a little bit <laughs> that we can share with ninja traders. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And, and, you know, of course, we'll have you back on, you know, we'll figure that out. And, you know, some exciting stuff coming the rest of the year um, going forward. You know, I I don't know if you've seen it, the NinjaTrader.com website has been overhauled and a lot of things happening here at Ninja and, and happy that you're going to be part of this. We we'll look forward to that a lot. And again, thanks everybody for being here today. And and thank Ninja Trader. Not everybody lets me speak this long. So thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Well, thank you, Larry, and thanks for, uh, you know, scrambling to get uh, where you could do this uh, and, and you know, have the show. We, we love having you on. And for all the viewers, thanks for coming uh, to the special event of Traders Workshop. Uh, we'll close out the day, a special, special day with Jim Cagnina and Mike Burke at Bar's Closing. So in the meantime, have a great trading day. We'll see you later.